our fourth session this afternoon. We've got two sessions to go. We've got the mystery session next door, which you must go to. It's going to be great towards the end of the afternoon. Um, but this session, we're really focusing around kind of ambient mobility, um, which is kind of around the kind of you know, interconnectedness between kind of different activities, different uh, um, systems, the kind of shadowlands, and making it all work into a single, seamless, wonderful uh, system. That's the plan anyway. And we've got four uh, differing presentations to offer perspectives on this. Uh, I'm delighted to start with uh, Jennifer Dungs from the Competence Centre Mobility Innovation uh, with, the, uh, with uh, Frauenhofer, who's with us. Are you with us? Where? Oh, welcome. Fantastic. I'm gonna, you, you, talk, you spend your life talking about ambient mobility, don't you? Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to let you be the skillful um, elucidator of it. And, uh, well, well, wait, wait, wait let me, OK. Let me open it. Starting from... <laughs> OK. <laughs> I can tell you on every second, don't you? It's not opening. OK. Here? Is that...? No. Oh. It's up there. OK, hold on. Is that okay. good? Good to okay, go? OK, now you can start it. Oh, brilliant. OK, hello. Today I will introduce one of the five catalyst projects in the ambient mobility collaboration between the Fraunhofer Institute and MIT. Together, we're designing and developing smart mobility solutions, and we're creating a synergy between the interdisciplinary research model at MIT and Fraunhofer's strength at transforming concepts into products. An example of this is the Charge Lounge. In August 2013, this was a concept, and today is a reality. It allows uh, customers to fast charge their vehicles while recharging themselves. And will be located at the rest stations along the Autobahn. So today, in context of the Ambient Mobility Collaboration with MIT, one of the five projects is called Urban Driven, whereby our vision is that vehicles will have learned how to drive. Or rather, we have developed the self-driving technology and intelligent transportation systems to allow drivers to become passengers. Often, the question comes where and when will this technology hit the market? It's predicted in 2035, as Paulo mentioned as well. The largest market shares will be in North America, followed by China and Western Europe, with an annual sales volume of 11.8 million vehicles. But we're asking a different question. We're asking the question of everywhere in context of which situations. And for those situations that are complex, unclear, or unstandardized, we'll fold in the critical social interaction aspects from the outside world to the vehicle. Now, what looks chaotic and random on a city street to the human eye is actually fairly predictable with a computer. And a self-driving car can pay attention in a way that a human physically can't. It doesn't get distracted or tired. An example of this is the Google self-driving car, whereby in this video, the vehicle can not only detect and maneuver around a cyclist, but it can also spot the arm waving of the cyclist. But driving is a complex, dynamic task. It involves interpretation and communication and includes a choice of what the driver does next in an ever-expanding set of situations. And for communication, a self-driving vehicle must learn to communicate in different situations and in various lands. But for, for example, with the horn, in Japan it's used only in an emergency or in a dangerous situation. But if you go to Italy or Nigeria, it's used to greet friends, celebrate happy occasions, somehow unstandardized. But let's assume that the vehicle learns how to communicate. 
I still cannot accept that the body is just a cybernetic machine and the brain is somehow a sophisticated computer and that machines will somehow replace humans entirely. So let's envision a future where both autonomous vehicles and humans exist and that autonomous vehicles and humans must learn to interact. It brings us to our goal, our task. Our task is a vehicle demonstrator that we can use in situations that are unclear and unstandardized, that we can test on humans to evaluate how to get their attention, what signals are most easily understood. We've designed and are focused on the entire social interaction circle to recognize, to interpret, to, to make a choice, and to communicate, but with the option of two-way communication. In our Mobility Innovation Lab, which are all invited to come visit in Stuttgart, we're modifying a fully electric Twizy vehicle with sensors, which allows us to track the movements and understand gestures and signals. The vehicle can also communicate with signal lights, an LED display panel, and a, okay, sound generator. <laughs> um, to try to get the, the attention of pedestrians. But still little is known about the effectiveness of pedestrian warning signals. One pedestrian dies every two hours. So we put together a short video to give you an example of an autonomous vehicle and a pedestrian trying to interact. <laughs> We're going to test this on humans to evaluate how they react, whether they need to be educated, and then we'll make proposals. And in the end, we hope to transform this idea, this concept, into a product. I say to be continued. If you want to see the video, we also have a blog. Um, capturing um, social interaction situations that people have encountered or could encounter, and you can search for our video on YouTube. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> I was just thinking of some of those other captions you'd have going across there. Um, okay, our next uh, presentation comes from uh, Nicole Friedman who works as director of bicycle programs for the city of Boston, a city that's gone from being uh, kind of worst in class to maybe towards best in class about how this mode of mobility has been evolved into the city and maybe connects or disconnects with uh, other forms of mobility. So great to have you with us and it will be interesting to hear the story. Thank you. Um, oh, how do I... So uh, I transferred out of MIT, so mine is not techie. But um, you may not know this, Boston was an award-winning cycling city, three times rated worst cycling city in the country. Uh, and in fact, we had an international award, worst cycling in the city in the world, and they gave it to us early. Um, and it was deserved at the time. We had, uh, in 2007, 180 feet of bike lane, and you can see it start up there and end down here. <laughs> Um, and for those of you that have driven in Boston, we are very unique drivers. I've never understood this photo with the cyclist on the double yellow and cars both coming towards us. Okay, so September 21st, 2007, a day you don't remember from history, Mayor Menino said we are going to transform Boston into a world-class cycling city. And then he said, Nicole, work out the details. Uh, so what is our charge? The charge really was to change culture. Um, so we started with a goal, and I remember telling Andy Clark, president of League of the American Bicyclists, our goal, it was to be a silver level bike friendly city in three years. Uh, when I told him this, he said, hmm. 
Okay, so then what do you do? Uh, we said, uh, well, we came up with a strategy which is to plagiarize because every city had gone before us. And here I'll quote myself, if I never have an original idea, we can be wildly successful. And to this day, I have never had an original idea. Um, as in all the social sciences, uh, we arranged a program around the five E's. So it's much more than just good engineering and infrastructure. Um, most important thing we did, though, was add in bike lanes. And to date, uh, we've gone from 180 feet to 90 miles of bike lanes. And since you guys are good in math, that is a 3,625% increase in bike lanes with a little mathematical gymnastics. Um, what's next, where all the countries are going, is protected, cycle, protected lanes. We see this over and over and over. Um, I always say my mom is quite smart. She knows that a truck can go right over that four inch line of paint. So we need some real protection uh, for the cyclists and that will dramatically increase ridership. Um, but again, it's much more than just bike lanes. We put in bike parking, 1,500 parking spaces throughout the city. We moved to some on-street parking. Um, and then we got a lot of calls for artistic bike racks. Um, and here is where you don't hire a former MIT person to come with up with the bike rack. I was doing a presentation. I looked up world's ugliest bike rack, and there was my bike rack. <laughs> uh, but we, we got a little smarter. I commissioned this one out. Um, other ease events, we want to encourage people to ride. We brought the first professional bike race to Boston in 20 years. We have the Hub on Wheels citywide bike ride and uh, a whole series of events throughout the season. Um, and one of the parts I'm most proud of is the community bike programs. Uh, making sure that the biking is for everyone in Boston. Uh, there's a term in the bike planning world, mammals. It's basically saying that all the bikers are sort of young white males. And we say that's not the demographic of Boston. Um, and then we said, OK, uh, we found an interesting statistic that 69% of the cyclists in Boston were male. And I will tell you, my, uh, all of my single female friends can assure you that Boston is not 69% male. Um, so uh, we started a women's initiative to try to promote women cycling and get that ratio to 50-50. Um, the E that's toughest is enforcement working with the police. This photo was actually not taken in Boston. Uh, it was taken here in Cambridge. Um, and then bike share, the part that uh, we techies really like. Uh, Paris launched bike share in 2007, and it transformed the city. Paris was just like Boston not really a cycling city. They had 54 million trips taken in two years, 180,000 members almost instantly. We said we need to get this to Boston. Um, and for a little history, generation one bike share, uh, I think it was Portland, Oregon, kind of a hippie city, painted about 200 bikes, put them out on the city, made them all yellow, and they were stolen in three days. Uh, Copenhagen said you dumb, or Amsterdam said you dumb Americans. Uh, so they made it coin operated, so you put in a coin deposit. You get your bike, and then you flip it in the canal. Um, so now we have solar, modular, mobile, and it's connected to your credit card. Uh, we launched Hubway in 2011. And since then, we have seen uh, actually record inc We have exceeded all expectations. We had over a million trips this year alone. Uh, we have 14,000 members. Everything's about 50% above what we anticipated it would be. Um, and in terms of equity, we, we have a a pretty significant subsidized member program. And this year, we launched Prescribe a Bike. Uh, and Prescribe a Bike is where a doctor can actually write a prescription for a Hubway membership for $5. So what is the end result? Uh, we have doubled ridership since 2007 when we started the program. Um, we did get our silver level award as a bicycle-friendly city by League of American City Bicyclists in three years. Um, and I've actually seen our ranking as high as number two in the country. Uh, that one was alphabetical. <laughs> but we have moved up quite a bit. Um, and that is it. And I hit my five minutes. Um, thank you to all of you. And it is uh, an army that makes it work. Great. So change is possible and at a pace. So. <laughs> Some fascinating insights there. Thank you very much. Uh, our next uh, presenter, uh, Luca Sacchi, is um, Senior Vice President at uh, Piaggio Group uh, and is also a head uh, in charge of uh, Strategic Innovation Department and the Future Mobility Lab 
and within that uh, is doing a lot of interesting work, um, uh, particularly around intermodality and some of the challenges uh, and issues there. So I think you've got some interesting uh, ideas to share with us. So uh, great to have you with us and look forward to your presentation. Excellent. Uh, you must excuse I, I've done this presentation while I was waiting to board a plane that never took off. So it was pro it's probably full of mistakes because it was not a machine and pretty nervous. So, <laughs> uh, so we've, we said that. You probably know, I mean, some of you maybe know Piaggio. More of you probably know Vespa. That's one of the main brands. It's one of those situations where the brand is stronger than the main company. Uh, we talk about the initially two major uh, well, point A, point B, it's the most obvious way to start a presentation on mobility. And it can be on by car or by bike, and often it's seen like this, but it's, the reality is a little more complicated. What we're trying to do is uh, moving in two main directions. One is trying, obviously, to make that path a little better. And we're doing that by moving towards other, other products, because this, in this presentation, obviously, we're talking about something. We are a, a, a company that produces vehicles, and so it would be, uh, we're talking about something that's near to production. We can do research in the, in the far future. So it's something that has to be monetized in a relatively short term. And one of the, uh, one of the things that we're trying to do, so one of the directions is extend the usage of, of certain products. So make products more versatile and be able to do more stuff. Obviously, one it can be the bicycle. This is actually the bicycle that we presented a few weeks ago. Uh, it's again an electric bike, nothing new there. And it's also the shape, uh, apart from trying to make it a little nicer than the usual electric bicycles, um, it's pretty conventional. What changes is the feature it has. It's a, a highly connected bike and has uh, an engine that has uh, an assistance and a gearbox, an electronic gearbox, so that the way that you use the bicycle itself can satisfy a different kind of commuting. Um, and obviously also has an anti-theft system because that's an, a big issue in, in electric bikes. Uh, so there's a way of commuting, to make it an easy commuting where the engine and the, and, 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 and the gearbox will assist you at a certain level so that the effort that you, that you do it's already, it's predictable, and you know how much effort you will make in that path. And you, ch you can tune it to be low, and so you have a map, and you use it as a, as a let's say, daily uh, house-to-work kind of commuting system. And or you can make it become an exercise vehicle. Uh, it becomes a fitness machine for the outdoors, uh, with uh, obviously changing the, 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 the features of the app. And... Um, it's actually in, due, due to the interaction with the ambient that, you, that you're using because that the same vehicle will be, let's say, has a, have a certain modality during the week and it become a different kind of vehicle during the weekend. Obviously, this is the first step that we are uh, uh, challenging in this field. It's called electric bike project because we want to include a lot of different vehicles and often a lot of different opportunities. Um, and this is starting in a way we have to uh, access the, the market with something that is readable and easily understandable by the people. But then there's, uh, so the user extension, extension that, we see, well, that, that we see is from a point A to point B, changing that to plus N, so increasing the, what you can do, but also extending that. How can we do, move that, that idea into making more cargo or, or more speed and so change the user itself and enlarge the, the surface? The other direction is obviously something which is uh, the extension of vehicles that we already have. So something like that can be covered, can be become a, easily become a car, become something that, it's, that will extend its use in very obvious ways. And that's something that we're working on. The other direction that we see in urban mobility is the specialization. So A to B now comes with a lot of vehicles used in the same moment. So you use different kind of solutions to get to the point A to point B. And that, in all ways, for us becomes A to B to C. And in every space, we have opportunities of vehicles that are more and more specialized. So on one direction, we try to get the same vehicle and extend its use. On the other, having specialized vehicles. We already uh, going to launch the uh, scooter sharing system in, in next year, uh, we see scooter sharing as very interesting because, in a way, cars and car sharing doesn't really solve the traffic problem. Scooters are obviously, by nature, a better vehicle. Moto taxi. Uh, just imagine that in, in, in only in, in Italy, we have uh, in the last year four million rents of cars uh, sharing. So it's 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 pretty successful. Um, and we have a vehicle which is already uh, like the embodiment of safety on 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 a scooter. And so it's already something that we, that we are leveraging on. 
but because it doesn't fall, that's already something that I would like if I use a taxi that on a, on a, on a motorbike. Um, but then again, it's only the beginning. The idea of having specialized vehicles for certain use, so get a locker and have scooters. This is Aprilia, it's another brand of ours. So designing stuff for this kind of specialized uh, um, uh, users is something that we're working on consistently. Um, and also trying to make, again, things that are focused on that direction. Um, but what does, I got horn, I think it's very in, in, in the theme. Um, what does a company like Piaggio, because a step back, all what, what we are talking about often in mobility is very focused on functionality. Instead, what we've always produced as a company, it's something different. I mean, products like this one, uh, have to do with a uh, special identity, for example. The Vespa is something that you connect with. And there's, so there's something more beyond that. Or for Gucci, the idea of, of freedom, or for Aprilia, the sports and, and emotions and passion. So what about adding a layer, and that's our main focus now for the future in, in Piaggio and the Piaggio Group, is how to bring back the pleasure of commuting and not only think about the efficiency in terms of time and, 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 and focus, but the pleasure of commuting, pleasure going in from one place to another place. And motorbikes are exactly that. You actually get the motorbike and you go from one place to the other only for the pleasure of the traveling with no reason apart from the travel itself. And we think that we strongly believe that has to go back in, in, a, in a product service and digital form uh, trying to, 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 to make, working with the ambient, to create another essence in commuting. And we try to call it emo emotional commuting, and that's our challenge in the near future. Thank, Thank you very much. And it will maybe it's particularly interesting to uh, further explore this uh, this emotional context to the commute. Uh, we, are, we all feel emotions when we're commuting, but, uh, but, but uh, maybe not the ones that <laughs> you're trying to develop. So that will be very interesting. Okay, our final presentation is from uh, Gil Perez. Great to have you with us. Uh, he's uh, SAP Senior Vice President of uh, Industry Cloud, General Manager of Connected Vehicles. Um, and I think he's got a lot of uh, doing a lot of work and uh, uh, things around this ambient mobility issue. So, Gil, it's great to have you with us and interesting to hear what you draw from your experience to, uh, uh, to this conversation. Great. Um, I'm actually going to start with... Uh, could we just click on which one? This one? Okay. We're going to start with a quick video, and then we're going to talk. And that's uh, something that Toyota ITC became public. A better fueling experience by using SAP HANA Cloud for Automotive and Toyota ITC's innovative connected vehicle solution. In life, there are choices, decisions to make, roads to follow. Some paths are easier traveled than others. Connected fueling powered by SAP and Toyota ITC will not only take you there, it'll take you further. In a world without connected fueling, drivers will be tempted to take their eyes off the road. Frustrations will rise while searching for nearby fueling stations. Time will be wasted. Personal information will be stolen. Patience will be lost. But what if things could be different? What if SAP HANA Cloud for Automotive and Toyota ITC Solution Connected Fueling Services could provide a delightful and seamless alternative? Well, it can. SAP HANA Cloud for Automotive integrated with Toyota ITC's in-car system provides a low fuel warning signal, quickly updating the navigation system to display the closest preferred fueling station. Employing Bluetooth low energy technology, the vehicle automatically identifies the correct pump, making it possible to authorize the transaction on the head unit from the comfort of your own vehicle. Utilizing the mobile payment option, the fueling station can provide loyalty points or an instant discount. 
personalized promotions based on user profile bring convenience and consumer savings directly to the driver. Creating opportunities to purchase those last minute necessities. The vehicle is now fueled, prompting the transaction to be settled. All of the day's transactions populate on the user account, providing the opportunity to review pertinent financial information in real time. Connected fueling powered by SAP HANA Cloud for Automotive and Toyota ITC's innovative solution is a convenient and secure. So how do I go over to the slide? So I saw some people being impressed. So thank you for your uh, amazing comments. So obviously at SAP, we're less of a technology company. We're more focused on the business processes. And what we try to show here is not so much the technology, the technology, because <clears throat> obviously nothing here is a technology breakthrough. The focus here is the business process. And a lot of people have been talking here about, a lot about technology, but think of one, one of the biggest problems that is happening today in cars is the privacy. We talked about privacy, we talked about data being monetized. What we're showing over here is a new business model, which OEMs, which automotive uh, uh, companies, oil and gas companies are adopting which is not selling data. It is a transaction based. Because what happened here, think of scenario number one. Scenario number one happened when you drive up to the gas station, you open your car, you take your credit card, and you transact with a POS, with a point of sale terminal. At that point, what really happens is a credit card transaction goes up to the cloud and really, the gas station owner has no sense. The, the, the car OEM brought you to your optimal gas station, but in essence hasn't been able to monetize it in any way. The minute that you now allow the OEMs to actually connect to the backend systems, to the payment switches, all of a sudden you have context. All of a sudden the OEMs are willing to, let's say, share the fuel level which is very important for the merchants. And all of a sudden you have now a marketplace in order to basically have one side the OEM, have another side the merchants, the various merchants, and the ability actually to do a transaction and to exchange based on not impressions, and not your data that is being collected, but on true transactions so with that, I will just say one more thing, which is these are the three use cases that we are focused on. Uh, obviously, parking is another very important one for us. Uh, we have multiple projects in, actually in, in Europe where we're focusing on parking congestion, um, which parking congestion is this, uh, again, um, a sensorless way to do mapping of an entire city and really on a street level provide a statistical model for uh, allowing you to figure out whether you have a high level of probability to, to find the parking or not. What we call your ETP, your estimated time to park. And obviously we are doing that again with a mindset of transactions. Why are we doing it? Because People pay for parking. People will pay on street, people will pay off street. We are trying to address the entire parking solution end to end. And with elements that are both freemium and actually provide an entire urban uh, uh, view, we're also combining uh, new business models. Thank you. Thank you very much. Fantastic, right, let's see if we can come back together again, please. Um, we've already started a great conversation here, but again, I, I'm, I'm just, I want to just place you at the centre of this. So, if so, because I can see two or three entry points, but I love those entry points to be coming from yourselves. So, is there someone who wants to, wants to lead us off? There's a lady there and then a gentleman towards the back there. So, okay. Hi, Mary Alice Haddad from Wesleyan University. Uh, thanks, 
everybody for such a great day. It's been really inspiring and interesting. Yeah. Um, and I just, a lot of the panelists from this morning and then also now have been talking on these innovative, exceptionally interesting solutions to problems that we're all facing. Um, and I'd like to hear from this group in particular about not just the technical or the social issues, but the political ones. Because what we've seen is, so Boston was terrible and then Boston was better. And so we've actually figured out how to, how to solve these problems in a lot of ways. But there's so many cities that have not solved them. And the problem isn't a technical one, it's a social or political one. So could, could people speak to that question? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, would you like to start? Because you have direct experience of interfacing with a political process that, uh, that he said, get on and do it. Well, uh, number one key to success is always the mayor. Um, right now, politically, well, it's true. Uh, but cities are leading, the states are not, and national government is not. So it is all about the cities, and it is all about the mayor. But with that said, the public is behind the mayors. I mean, there's nothing that we've done or other cities have done that's not obvious. The tools are out there. They're in the toolkit. Everyone knows what needs to be done. Um, but it, you know, we're, we're, what we really have is this battle between a very individualistic society and um, the tools are all about the sharing economy and sharing. You know, and when you talk about putting in a cycle track, which is uh, will double or triple ridership practically overnight, uh, you're removing something, whether it's a travel lane or parking, and in Boston, parking is a constitutional right practically. Um, but it, it is amazing, like we'll have a beautiful plan and there is one person that tends to go to public meetings and that one person does not want their personal on-street parking spot removed and that can shut the whole thing down. Right. Um, that's what we're facing. It's the change from individual to shared, I think. So is this about visionary leadership? Because there are not votes in restricting my ability to drive around in a car. In fact, there are votes if you don't do that. So it's easier to keep your head below the parapet on this issue, uh, it takes courage, I don't know, to be the leader, the political leader that says, we are going to make the city different. And I just wonder whether that's a, whether others have experience interfacing with, 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 the, with the public authorities within which you are I, I, developing I, I solutions. Can, I can mention that we obviously decided to actually stay away from that. Uh, because we feel that, um, again, with the topics, with specific topics, uh, with all the changes that is happening, you can obviously, you need to engage with the cities, but they're obviously not going to be the first ones to go in. So there needs to be some very strong business as well as social and citizen push in order to get them over. Yeah, you might have one city, Barcelona, I'm just, Barcelona, Boston, you might have all right. kinds of different cities that might have, um, you know, f um, I would say uh, uh, a thought leadership and, leader and, and mayors that are willing and as well as an environment. But we believe that uh, uh, actually the, us as citizens and creating a sustainable also business model will drive it. Okay. The I think, as, as often happens, it's not one way only or the other. It's the, uh, often in the municipality, we see them as enablers of some opportunities even for private companies. And then if the thing catches up on the, the, the public, then it changes. Uh, the example, like, like I saw the example of Paris or Milan that were, as you said, not uh, particularly keen on, on, on cycling and bicycle use. Usage and with the sharing, he said that the thing exploded. And obviously, then the social, general social conscience on a cyclist changed. So also the, the the driver of the car has now a different attitude because they start seeing thousands of bicycles around. So it, it changes the mentality of the citizenship in the moment that you have something that you have to cope with, and you start seeing. So as I mean, we are uh, animals that adapt, and, and I, I see that. And it's important to give the opportunity to have a new experience to see what what happens. Right. You want it? Not really. Okay. I just wanted to add. I don't know whether that offers you a couple of thoughts there. Uh, just interesting tweet come in. Um, there was quite a lot of talk in the presentations uh, 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 around 
moving towards kind of service mobility. And I just would like to, uh, there's a question here saying, how is the culture of mobility changing with the shift from ownership to service mobility? Is this, apart from means that someone else has to service the stuff, which is great, is there anything deeper that's going on within that within that shift? Well, uh, f from our point of view, radical. I mean, in the, same, in, in the moment that I've introduced the idea of making the sharing scooter sharing, it's like the business changes. Just imagine, imagine from the, the board of the company that says, OK, now you're not earning money anymore from selling the product, but you start selling by usage. And already internally, it's, it's, it's a radical change, uh, probably much more than the, the user. The user adapts more rapidly than, than, than the companies and, and than the institutions, probably. Right. Do you yeah. Um, I mean, what, what, what's not changing is, is kind of the first slide that I think was in your presentation where people still have to go from A to B. Yeah. But how they're doing that and how they consider mobility is changing. And so if um, with, the, with the digital world exploding with smartphones and services folding into mobility, we're now looking at mobility as a service where you can choose these different variations of intermodality to still reach your, reach your destination and somehow it's, it's, it's creating a mind right. change in, in okay. I just trying to remember something tweaked with me that, uh, uh, that something deeper is happening in that, for example, with, with car share schemes, if you've got your car you know, on, the, on the drive, you hop in and you go and get the milk and come back again. If you're part of a car sharing scheme where there's just, just this tiny little hurdle, it, the, the, the amount of miles that people drive, I, I, someone maybe is an expert on this, drops dramatically because you just make thoughtful, considered decisions rather than just hopping into the car to go and buy another odd thing. It just begins to evolve your, your mobility behaviour and patterns. And so I just wonder whether there is something deeper and interesting that could be going on in that shift. D did you want to I, I just want to say that there is a tremendous shift happening from a business model perspective. Just imagine, again, it was the Uber at the beginning that talked about the $18 billion in, in medallions in, in New York. Think of the fact that uh, an OEM which ha or Vespa that has been selling a car and has gotten $10,000 for that car. That car is now being used, as we all know, only a couple of hours a day. There's huge uh, lack of efficiency on it. And all of a sudden, you're saying, OK, we have autonomous cars. All of a sudden, we will, you know, from their perspective, this product becomes a service. Right. It changes the, the way they will sell. The, it changes the way they interact with their customers. They don't, I mean, there's, it's, it's a, has profound implications on, on multiple levels. So it's the automotive that are selling. Obviously, it will have an impact on other uh, uh, industries, the suppliers. So if you, if you think about this change that is happening, it is potentially a profound change beyond just the technology and putting things together. Um, right. And there are very forceful you know, companies that have billions of dollars in stake here that have different conflicting interests in this. And it will be fascinating <laughs> to see what will happen, which business yeah. models will, will emerge. Right. Okay. Can I just add one, one yeah. thing, though, um, to this? Just to add on, I think this is exactly right, but there's some parts that were, are not changing so much, which is the topic of comfort with respect to mobility, the, the topic of fun or somehow enjoyment. Um, the, these, these things are in, in somehow ingrained in us. Um, driving is fun. It's an experience, and we kind of talked about the experience um, how to repackage that mobility experience in these different business models, in these sharing models. And I think we, we won't be able to let go of comfort factors. And like you said, to, to go get your milk, maybe, maybe right. you don't go get it at all if it's not comfortable yeah. <laughs> or too uncomfortable. Yeah. Have you got a point around this? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I wanted to add, Asaf Betterman here uh, with Sensible City Lab, wanted to add a quick point on this, and maybe more than a question. Uh, then maybe getting your milk uh, um, is part of an example of another 
at least as big a change that will happen in cities w with regard to logistics. Right, so, I mean, if you have a self-driving car, why do you need to hop in it to get your milk? Um, and and so, so I, I think and logistics has a huge impact on traffic in the city. We haul products from the suburbs into the city to just to hold them back out into the suburbs. Right? So th that's another thing that we'll mm -hmm. see being impacted very much. Interesting. I was going to say, from a city perspective, I think the changes are profound when you get to the self-driving vehicles. Um, you know, right now, the city spends an inordinate amount of time and space on parked cars, yeah. for instance. And we always say 50 to 80% yeah. of the uh, property owned by the city is dedicated to the roads. Exactly. Uh, right now, um, you know, 95, you know, five, I think it's something like 95% uh, of the cars are driven 5% of the time. Hmm. That gets reversed. 5% uh, as many cars will be driven 95% of the time, and you free up all this space. Um, and that, that can have a profound impact on the quality of life for people if all that space becomes open space, shared space, park space, et cetera. Mm. Uh, and in terms of budgets, transportation is one of the biggest budgets in the entire city. Uh, it costs a million dollars to pave a mile of roadway. Um, we could put that into education. We could put that into uh, you know, so many other more useful things. Mm. Okay. I wanted to open up, you, you touched on getting towards the emotional side of things, which I think is just, you know, uh, happy experiences and all the rest of it. And it, it wasn't a theme I expected to emerge in this, uh, this day, so I'm, uh, I'm excited about it. I just, wanna, just wanted to just explore it a little bit further, because it does feel as though it's sort of been pushed slightly to the margins in terms of it's getting from A to B in the most fastest, most efficient, cheapest manner, and now I'm... Now I'm hearing the sensations of feeling the, I mean, I, like I, I, I'm at the hotel down the river and I had a choice. I could either have got the shuttle somewhere to Kendall Square or something, but I thought, hang on, maybe I'm gonna walk. Mm -hmm. And I had the most inspirational early morning walk along the Charles looking over the city, which for me was just a, just a moment of sweet inspiration. And, I, and I'm just wondering whether you, you touched on this, how we're, how we're reconnecting and, and, and drawing out the, the you know, tra travel as a, a, a great, happy, interesting, sociable or antisocial experience. Is, is, are you looking at that as well at all? I mean, you've got your happy yeah, car. Yeah. So when I get hit by a car, it goes, whoops, sorry. So that's, uh, oh, whoop, near miss, another near miss. But uh, I just wonder how big a theme this is that's here, emerging through here. So I, I can give a, a, an interesting use case from our world. Um, we actually created a, a car sharing um, at our headquarters. And we thought we'll, we'll save. The biggest thing was actually people sharing the right together. And I think it was raised in one of the earlier conversations. The facts and the connections that you make in the rights became the biggest draw. So it wasn't about the saving or the economical. <coughs> it was that um, experience. Mm -hmm. uh, that social experience. Mm -hmm. And I think we're going to see all kinds of different experiences and all kinds of different right. uh, transportation, whether it's going to be the scenery outside or whether it's going to be the social right. interaction or whether it's going to be something else. And it's going to be, have to be part of the experience because people are looking for an experience. Yeah. And I just, I, mean, I wonder also whether this is, you know, this is not the elephant in the room, but an opportunity in the room that because I'm, I'm, I'm not quite sure about all this clever stuff you're doing. I don't really want to know about it. I just want to have a great city, living, happy experience. And, and maybe, the, maybe the narratives, you know, don't tell me about how clever you're interfacing DBS, PIL, I'm not, I'm not bothered. I just, I want to feel, I want to, I want to smell, I want to live, I want to be safe. And, and I just wonder whether we're, there's a whole narrative here which is huge, which and, and we're there's, we're only touching well, yeah, on possibilities. Uh, you just want to annoy you want a Vespa to go. No, not really. The it's it's it's, <laughs> it, it's we are tr actually working. Uh, uh, I would say scientifically, trying to understand what are the components that make it a pleasurable right. experience. In the end, we, we started from that. Uh, I'm not in Piaggio for I mean, a long time, but uh, there has, when you go on a ride on, on a motorbike, it's, it's a totally different experience. And uh, what, what's, uh, what's about it? 
that makes mm -hmm. it a different experience. And how, um, it, obviously, it's a question of, of sensorial activity, sensations, but also the fact that the, um, it's, you're being exposed. And I think that's a very interesting element. Uh, a car, it's a shelter, but also an enclosed shelter. It, you close yourself in, 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 in a space, and especially in the US, it's like this the extension of your private space. Uh, instead, when you're forced to share a car, or because it's a strange sensation when you see somebody that's getting the car that you just left yeah. at the car sharing, it's like, mm, don't yeah. tell me, I mean, it's a little bit mine. And I really love that thing, that, that very short connection that you get with that, with that uh, uh, product. And in some way, when you're open and exposed, I think that we have to face all the uh, emotional elements that have to do with it. Mm. And for us, it will be trying to leverage on that. We, we are an emotional right. company, so we, that's what differentiates us. And, and it's maybe it's just, I don't know, maybe a huge opportunity here. I, I, mean, I saw the other day, I think it was on Facebook, uh, there's some uh, in Amsterdam. Yes, they've, done a, they've done a length of cycle path, yeah. and basically it's uh, solar powered, and, yeah. and it's, there's, a, there's a Van Gogh. Van Gogh design. Whoops. So it's just it's just as you cycle along it. I don't know whether it shifts or whatever, but it's just this brilliant Van Gogh swirling design, and it just lifts the spirits. And uh, we've got another thing in Bath where there's this tunnel that's two miles long. You cycle along, and halfway along there's an installation that is offering the sound of steam trains done on a cello. And you just think, well, you're halfway through this with your lycra on. Ah, suddenly it's, it's been worth living, briefly. Uh, on this theme, have you got a... Do you want to add a comment on that one? Uh, yes. Uh, my name is Adrian. Uh, I'm actually from the Netherlands. <clears throat> so have you been along that length of... Uh, no, but I saw it on the news, and it right. looks uh, very interesting. I'm not sure if I should stand, you know. All Dutch are like seven... Feet, so I think so. Just, just, <laughs> just. Yeah. Uh, okay. that's well, it's actually six, uh, six. So. Uh, so I have a question from Miss uh, Friedman. Uh, in Holland, uh, the Dutch are pretty sensitized because a lot of the drivers are bikers and and vice versa. The bikers are drivers. So is your goal to actually get, you know, in Boston, the drivers think bikers are aliens? So is My it your, mom does as well. <laughs> so is it your goal to uh, have uh, the drivers uh, leave the car and go biking? Or do you want just to add bike paths and leave the, uh, the drivers alone? Another question, in Holland it's almost, uh, you know, it's, there's like a tax-driven uh, system uh, that uh, makes people not want to drive their car because it's too expensive. Is this also something that you try to achieve here with your project? Well, we'll start with question two first. Uh, I always say if I could do uh, anything uh, to make Boston more bike friendly, I would never add a single mile of bike lane. I would put in a congestion charge, have a $10 gas tax, uh, remove all the parking, and everyone would be biking. I wouldn't need a bike lane. So yes, that's my dream. <laughs> Um, uh, but I, uh, That's some ticket, that is. It is Good not, luck. When you guys saw the recent election, we wouldn't even index gas prices, or <coughs> gas, the gas tax. We're so far from that, which is a real shame. Um, we talk about making Boston a world-class bike city, which would be about 10% of trips made by bike is the beginning of it. And, and interestingly, uh, you know, we do, in the United States, put in the ground a lot of the best features as they have in the Netherlands and still without the, the fees and the pricing, you know, we can't get quite there. But I will say this, we can probably get up to 7 to 10% of trips by bike, um, you know, tip of the iceberg. Uh, at that level, yes, a lot of your drivers will be cyclists and that helps immensely. But no matter what, we still want the physical protection because even if you are a driver, next to a cyclist, we need roads that are safe and make it easy to coexist together. Right. And bike lanes are a great first start, it's better than nothing, but there's still a lot of drivers out there that even with a bike lane, they struggle to pass a cyclist and accidents are happening at the intersections. So the more separation and protection, the better. Right, yeah. Can I, can I just Please. challenge my neighbor here for uh -oh. a minute? <laughs> um, yeah, so coming from the auto industry for 14 years, and I want to understand your drive to remove all vehicles. So we have electric vehicles, they're CO2 free, they're quiet. We have car sharing and intermodality with public transportation and 
all types of modes interconnected to reduce congestion, to reduce parking. You can factor in future technologies that were talked about earlier with the autonomous vehicles leaving the city center to go park, coming back in when, when, it, when you need to get someone. So not taking up parking spots in the city at times of congestion. So I love biking, but do we need to get all of cars off the road? Or Great question. No, we don't need to get all cars off the road. What we really do want to do is uh, eliminate and minimize many of those trips that could be better taken on something more efficient. And I would say this, many of you probably visited Boston as a tourist. Um, you probably didn't say, wow, what a great city. I got to sit in my car. I mean, what makes Boston special is you are outside, you are experiencing the city, you're walking, you're talking to people. Um, and that, that is what makes a vibrant city uh, and a great quality of life. And, you know, go out west to some of the newer driving cities, even, you know, L.A. I mean, they're not great places to live or be. And yeah. look at when you talk about where you want to live, when you talk to realtors about what sells, it is not, you know, a place that is next to or on a four-lane road. And we have four-lane roads in the middle of Boston. Mm -hmm. um, so, no, we don't have to permanently eliminate. And so it, we can make a compromise? Oh, yeah, we can make a deal. Okay. <laughs> we can be friends. Okay. 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 <laughs> oh. Thank you. Uh, our time is pretty well up on this. I'd love once again just to come along the line. I mean, this, there's so many dimensions to this kind of ambient mobility issue that just very, very interesting. But if, if you just wanted to reinforce or lob one kind of take-home thought around this issue about the world we're entering towards and the sort of stuff that we should be either researching or thinking about or being involved in, what would that kind of kind of take home thought from this arena B. Can I start with you? Absolutely. Um, I would say the fact that uh, citizens uh, use the, uh, the ambient in terms of mobility uh, really as, as a tool, they use it and instead of connecting. And connection doesn't come from the technology and the vehicles themselves, right. but it's trying to connect people back to uh, also, the, 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 the idea of accepting the, to be vulnerable in a way, and the city needs that exposure of the person in relation to the social space. And I think that that's, the institutions have to work a lot on, on that, but that will be a huge improvement in the, in the okay. quality. Interesting. Gil? I would just say that uh, you know, business model innovation is as strong of a, of a component to all of this as everything else. And if you at the end of the day, don't have the, the right combination on, on, you know, just like was said before, hey, we don't have, you know, money to start bike sharing. We, we need to come up with all kinds of innovative models to sustain, to have a really sustainable uh, uh, program. So it's not as if it needs to be 100% profitable or it needs to be that, but there needs to be a balance. Just like on the bike sharing, we saw, for example, a new balance um, okay. um, logo there. That means somebody probably paid for that. Mm -hmm. um, that's a way to use now bike sharing. In order. So we need, to, we need to figure out how do we not only drive technology forward, but we need in the same time understand that the business models and the players uh, okay. that are in this need to also adapt. Got it. Thanks. Nicole. I would like to see the framework of all the technology that happens really uh, focusing on you know, what is the ultimate impact on quality of life? Um, you know, and oftentimes you have to zoom out to the macro scale. So taking cars off the street uh, will help an individual having a self-driving car, but it also does, on the macro scale, improve the quality of life for everybody. Right. Um, I kind of want to throw a ball um, back, back to my neighbor again, because <laughs> what, what I like, um, so today was really inspiring and everything was forward facing and, and, I, and I appreciate all of this and I'm leaving inspired. But somehow I think there's a lot of smart people in this room and somehow I feel like we're still thinking inside the box. And so I think as a challenge to maybe all of us, if we can, you know, like you said, okay, envision a city with all bikes, envision a world with all bikes. I don't know, envision something radical and see what this looks like. I think that conversation would also right. be interesting. 
Um, a great note to end this conversation on. Uh, Leisure, gentlemen, our speakers, our panel, thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Terrific. Lovely.